you have joined us this morning for worship. We ask you, join in singing with us to the Lord God Almighty. Father in heaven, how we love you. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established on our praises. As your people declare your mighty words, blessed be the and welcome to worship with our first Fairhope family believers. On this day, we remember and celebrate our fathers. While no earthly fathers are perfect, Father's Day reminds us that we do have a heavenly father who is a good, good father who is perfect, who loves us, who meets all our needs, and who's worthy of all of our praise. If you're visiting with us this morning online, we're so glad you've joined us for worship. I want to ask you to do something, if you wouldn't mind, and that's to take out your cell phone and to text the word welcome to the number you'll see at the bottom of the screen. If you'll fill out that online connect card, our pastor would love to get in touch with you in the near future. Well, when the disciples asked Jesus how to pray, he uttered those famous words that we know as the model prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So now, as John L. Pope comes to lead us in prayer, Let's bow our heads and focus our thoughts on our Heavenly Father. Lord, it's good to be in your house this morning. We thank you for the opportunity on this Father's Day. I praise you, Father, for the instructions you give us on being a godly leader in our homes. I ask that you give the fathers the wisdom, courage to lead the home in a great need of godly leadership. I pray you will strengthen the fathers of our nation and empower them. Lord, Father, I thank you for how, our, how you've blessed us, continue to bless our church. I lift up our staff as you guide them and continue to make decisions as we reopen the church. I lift up Dr. Hankins this morning and pray for him as he delivers a message you have placed on his heart. Please make our hearts and minds be receptive to your word. We love you. Thank you for loving us. I ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This morning we thought we would celebrate Father's Day by having a conversation with a father and son. Uh, this is Carrie and Jack Flowers. They've uh, been active members of our church for a long, long time. In fact, there are three generations now of flowers uh, that are involved in the life of our church. Carrie is a leadership consultant. Uh, Jack will be heading into his senior year at Auburn in civil engineering. And uh, uh, their life together in Christ has been bound up with our life together at First Fair Hope. So we just wanted to Talk about those things, about the great gift of God uh, to us, of family and of fatherhood. 
and I can think of no two better people to talk about that kind of thing uh, than Carrie and Jack. Me, me and my brothers talk about this all the time, but whenever we were young, we used to all sleep in the same bed, which is like honestly longer than we should have. Um, but <laughs> but anyway, for a long time, we had what we called the brother band, which we'd all, um, it'd, it'd be all the three boys, and then dad would come and we'd you know, read a Bible story. I remember Samson and, and, and several different ones, but we'd always close by like, grabbing each other's forearms and making a little square and, and then praying at the end of it. And so that was a blast. Except one time mom joined us and then, um, yeah. That was not cool. Yeah, it was not it was, it wasn't very cool. But anyway, that was, another, that was kind of a cool moment growing up because it was consistent and it was fun to like yeah. all pile in together and, and have some time and, and, you know, enjoy God's word together. And so... Jack, your dad sought to give optimistic leadership uh, to uh, to you guys and, and in your home. And so what would you say or some of the things that, that um, you uh, gained from him and from his spiritual leadership in your home? How's that, how's that uh, some of those lessons and those values, how do those play a role in your life now? Yeah, um, I can say probably the biggest thing was... Um, you know, if you ever woke up earlier than dad, you'd go downstairs and you'd find him reading God's Word. And, you know, in high school, it was in the couch in his room. And, you know, since going to college, it was the, the, the chair in the living room. And so, honestly, if there's been anything that I've learned from dad is just the love for, for God's Word. And, um, you know, if I have a theological question, the, the first person I call is dad. And then my Go ask person. your mother. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I usually say. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, then, and then my college pastor second, you know. So it's been cool to see, like— you know, I've seen him consistently in God's Word, and because of that, naturally, like, he teach me, and I'd ask questions, which lead more questions, and then more of a love, and then um, it's cool to see now, like, I try to have the same patterns and habits and enjoy those conversations with Dad and my other brothers as well, so. Awesome. Um, the critical reality of parenting is handing on God's Word. That's a Deuteronomy 6 thing. That's something that, that uh, we, we hope to value at our church, and, and I'm trying to live that in my own life, and a great gift to give. And so, Kerry, what, as you watch your son, he's, he's, he's a man, he's uh, heading out into to the, the, the calling uh, God's created and gift, gifted him for. So what makes you most proud of Jack as you see him walking in, into the future? I think, and he's already alluded to it, I, you know, I think finding the truth and hanging on to it um, is very, very important for Christy and I to see and all our boys, but I think Jack has, has done that very, very well. That would be the first thing. And then the second thing is, uh, I, if I think of Jack, I think of integrity. And just because of um, the way he is at home is the way he is at school, the way he is in front of his friends. It doesn't matter if it's adults or, you know, his peers. Um, I just I always think about the root word of integrity being whole, you know, an, an integer. And I see Jack is living that out. Um, no matter the situation, that makes a dad very, very proud. So what, as, as you think about where we are, where we are as a culture, um, what, are, what are some of the greatest opportunities uh, and challenges for, for men, uh, for, for fathers and sons? What do you think is the, are some prospects and what do you think are some, uh, some challenges that we're, that we're, that we're going to be facing? I think there's a lot. I think as far as on the sun side of things and the whole culture now, I think young young men are is, is just um, a little naiveness as far as like they don't understand how important the relationship with the father is, and it's so easy to be distracted now. I mean, hours on video games or um, wanting to do anything but stay at home when you turn 16. Um, I think that that a lot of people don't understand the how um, valuable a good solid relationship built on quality time where the father is. And I think on the father's side in this changing culture, there's a lot of pressure, you know, with social media, like this father's doing this, like should I do this? And then I think also um, there's so many self-help books out. I think there's just a lot of pressure on fatherhood that didn't really used to be there. But that being said, I think in the same kind of culture shift recently, I think there's a lot more free time. And um, um, I think that creates more opportunity for fathers and sons to do things they enjoy together, like you know, fishing or, 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 you know, hiking or, you know, whatever, man stuff, you know, yeah. sharpening <laughs> knives, I, what do you know, whatever it is. Um, but that's what, I mean, that's what kind of what I think about for future and, and upcoming generations. And I see the, the father's role as um, one of the challenges is that there's such a sea of information. I think you have to be that, that true north uh, and you have to get that from the scripture. Otherwise, you know, both you as a father and the son are going to be misled. 
And so I think it's, it's critical to not only know what the truth is, but to model it. Because, I mean, kids are pretty smart. They're going to see right through all that. And if, if you don't model what you're telling them, um, they're, they're going to go their own way. They're going to find something else that they see as truth. Well, thanks so much for sharing yeah. uh, a little bit about uh, your experience uh, with uh, coming to uh, really have a fresh appreciation for God's fatherhood and the way that's pictured uh, in your lives together. And uh, hope you have a happy Father's Day. Um, uh, uh, thank you for um, soaking up uh, the wisdom uh, from God's Word through your dad and through our church. And, and we are proud of you, too. <laughs> and uh, uh, go out and, and uh, do what God's created you uh, to do. And uh, uh, we're thankful uh, this morning uh, for God's great love for us in Christ Jesus, for uh, his never failing uh, faithfulness as our, as our Heavenly Father. Today is Father's Day, and we continue to worship our Heavenly Father for he is worthy. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all our glad songs we
pray with me? And we sing to a God who knows our name and knows our name so much who actually has given each one of us who believes in you a name. And it says that you call us sons and daughters of God. And we sing to that God. We praise the only God, the one who loves us so much. Look how great a love a father has for us that we should be called children of God. And you've given us instruction in your word. When the Pharisees tried to trap you and asked you the greatest commandment, when you said, love the Lord your God first, your heart, mind, strength, soul, and the second, to love our neighbor as ourself. God, before we ever have an opinion of what's going on in this world, if we're not loving our brother, our neighbor as ourself, Father, convict our hearts, change our mindset, exchange our hearts for your hearts, God. And you tell us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says, you make every effort to pursue peace with others because without that, no one will see the Lord. And so God, we just want to see you. We want to show the world how great your love is and how you've given us grace, not just to be received, but to be extended and to reach others with your grace, your love and your mercy. So God, thank you. Thank you that we can gather into a place to shout the praises of your great name, to be encouraged in your word and to sing your truth. And we give you this day in Jesus' holy name, amen. Midney Shepherd is gonna come at this time and sing, this is what grace is for. This is what grace is for. Oh, this is 
Open your Bibles, if you will, again to Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to look together just one verse tonight as we've been exploring together what it means to be image bearers. The great value of the doctrine of being made in the image of God. I believe that this central core, fundamental, foundational truth gives us great instruction and great footing as we seek to speak truth into the current cultural conflict that we see raging all around us. You know, it's so good to hear uh, Carrie Flowers and his son Jack share a little bit about God's great gift of the relationship between a father and a son. We see in their lives a picture of what's called for in Scripture, that the role of fathers is inviolable. The role of fathers is absolutely necessary to human flourishing. It's a critical feature, a creational feature of what it means to be a human being. We all need fathers to give definition and shape to our lives. But yet in this day, in our culture, even this week, such notions of fatherhood, of masculinity, of family, all those things that until recently we took for granted in, in terms of their meaning, now those things are being contested. Another blow was delivered just this week. I don't know if you've been keeping up with the Supreme Court, but a, a decision was delivered in the Bostock a case that they've been considering. And the notions of sexual orientation and gender identity have now been added to the legal understanding of gender. So the legal understanding of biological gender. So uh, it, it isn't just a person's biology that determines their identity. But now it's that person's opinion. It's their feeling. It's the, it's the people to whom they're sexually attracted. Those things are now determinative of a person's identity. And the question is, is that a good idea? Is that how we should be defining gender? Is that concomitant with what is true and good and beautiful? We are struggling with the answer of who am I? Last week we looked at, at Genesis chapter 1 to answer the question in terms of fundamental identity. And now I want to, uh, to address the issue of gender when it comes to what the Bible teaches about human sexuality and how we're to live and how we're to speak truth and how we're to talk about human flourishing in a day and age when everything seems to be being completely redefined. We're living our lives on the other side of the sexual revolution. We're living our lives in a day and age uh, in which the fundamental belief about human sexuality and gender is do what you want, do what you feel like doing. And any choice you make with respect to sexuality and gender is as good as any other choice anyone else might make. They're all effectively the same. But what we believe is that gender, and what we're going to learn from God's Word today is gender is not a choice you make. It's not a, a flavor you pick. But gender is a creational gift that's to be stewarded in line with God's great purposes for you and the world. It's a critical feature of how God makes us and how God fits us together and how God uses us to fulfill the, the task of showing forth His glory in the world. God defines gender, and God, God's definition of gender and gift of it is indeed a great gift to you, and it answers the question, who am I? And in, in, in the being made in the image of God answers a lot of questions about who am I, but the fundamental question of this sermon is going to be who I am, am I in terms of masculinity and femininity, who, I am, who am I in terms of my gender. And so here's what Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says. Real quick, just one verse. God created man in his own image. Now, remember, we learned last week what it means to be created in the image of God, what it means to be image bearers. First of all, it's a foundational idea. Right here in the very beginning of the Scriptures, we are told that we are image bearers. What that means is, is that we have innate value. And it's a transcendent value. 
And we're to understand ourselves as being made in the image of God, and we're to understand everyone else that way as well. If we're going to make it as a people, if we're going to make it as a culture, our basic declaration is this, that I come to understand that I have infinite worth because of who God says I am, and everyone else has that worth as well, and I'm to treat them as such. That's the key. I'm not my group. I'm not uh, who I am on some dividing line between the oppressed and the oppressor, but I am an image bearer. And so is every single other person on the planet. And the key to a future together is knowing that about ourselves and treating everyone else that way as well. Any other way to understand human identity is a lie and it's designed for our destruction. And so we've gotta know what God's word says and we've gotta be willing to, uh, d- to, to declare it to those who need to hear it. So as I shared with you last week as well, uh, we need to be about an apologetic task. That means we need to be willing to give a defense of what we believe. We need to be willing to share uh, the truth that uh, is the foundation for our lives. We need to do it with joy. We need to do it with hope. We need to do it with great faith and great love. And so the things I'm going to be discussing, even as I raise the issue of gender, you can feel the tension in the room. You know this is a hotly debated issue. And there's things that we're supposed to say now and things that we're not supposed to say. It causes us to want to shrink back from the public square. But I hope that what God's word will do for you is equip you that you can speak the truth in love. And you can call people, even people who disagree with you, you can call them to stand with you on this truth. That we are made in God's image. And we're to treat one another in terms of that truth. And if we'll do that, the door will open to the possibility and the hope of redemption together. And so we need to understand this morning the truth from Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, that image bearing is the basis and the purpose of human sexuality. Image bearing is the basis and the purpose of human sexuality. Once again, we're in the midst of a great battle between paradigms, between worldviews. The Judeo-Christian worldview is the one that sits at the very basis of Western civilization, of, of, of the values of our nation. This idea that we're all equal We all have great value and worth, and we can treat each other that way. That is now being contested by this idea that your identity comes from the group you identify with, and everything is to be laid out in terms of oppression and oppressor, and those who belong to the oppressing group don't have as much value as those who are being oppressed. Those who are in the oppressing group are those that need to be pulled down so that those who are on the other side of the equation can be lifted up. But that is not how we are to view one another. Instead, we're image bearers. And so in this issue of gender, image bearing is the basis and purpose of human sexuality. So I want you to see three things from this verse and from how Jesus Christ completes this idea First of all, I want you to see image bearing and gender, image bearing and gender. The biblical revelation is astounding. In the ancient Near East, when, when uh, Moses first p- penned these words, the view of women and the treatment of women was horrific. And then you had this amazing revolutionary and revelational declaration that men and women are of equal value in God's sight. They've been created together for his purpose. And the gift and the beauty of masculinity and the gift and beauty of femininity are the same in God's sight and ought to be the same to one another. Men and women reflect the image and the glory of God together. In fact, we cannot do so independently. There's something about our genderedness and that connectivity that fully reflects the glory of God. And so the Bible says it's not good for man to be alone. And I think we can draw from that that it's not good for a woman to be alone. But together, men and women in relationship with one another, they reflect the glory of God. It's two becoming one flesh. This miracle that puts on the display of God's glory. It's being for the other. 
It's, the, it's living uh, your life with a sense of, uh, of an outward look to someone else. That's a picture of what it means to be image bearers. And so what God's word says here, uh, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Here's what I want you to catch, first of all, is that gender is a bodily reality. Gender is not a choice you decide on your own. Gender is not to be construed in terms of a particular sexual attraction that you have, sexual attraction that you have, but gender is a bodily reality. And what that means is there are two genders and only two. God created men and God created women. And they are... Uh, like opposites of one another. That's what uh, Genesis chapter 2 says, that uh, the woman was created as an etzer konegdo, like opposite, an opposite rescuer for the man. And so men and women are not the same. They are not interchangeable. And that biology and the sexual traits that come with that biology, why those things determine the way men and women experience the world. And so women, of the many things that women are, are uniquely created to do, I, this is going to shock you to death, but women are uniquely created to, to bear infants and care for infants. And there is, a, there is a way in which their bodies are wired for that that's different than the way men are wired. Men are made to take care of women while they take care of children. And so we're given the equipment and the tools that we need to kind of go out uh, uh, to explore, uh, to provide so that our wives can nurture and be the center point of the family and the home along with doing a lot of other things. Men and women are the same in, in, in a lot of capacities and other things. And Proverbs 31 pictures a woman that's being industrious and creative and, uh, and, uh, and starting a business. All those things are wonderful. But it does not mean that men and women are interchangeable. Gender is a bodily reality. You're born male or you're born female. And that's a, a gift of God and a picture of his great creative desire for us. But sin entered the world and sin brings alienation. Sin fundamentally is a rejection of God's call to be image bearers at every, in every area. And so sin also affects the way we live out our gender. We're alienated sexually. And you see that in the, the very first moments in the garden after the first sin. What do they do? They hide, they cover their genderedness. They're embarrassed of their vulnerability. They once were naked and not ashamed, and now they're hiding from one another. They're embarrassed of their vulnerabilities. They refuse to share uh, these things that God has given them that make them distinct from one another. And then the curse has come. A woman no longer experiencing blessing as she brings children into the world, and a man struggling day by day as he seeks to provide and so sin brings alienation, and, and that alienation manifests itself in all kinds of ways. And sometimes alienation with respect to gender manifests itself in same-sex attraction. All of us experience sexual brokenness. Everybody does because that's the result of sin, and it manifests itself in all kinds of different ways. And some people experience that, uh, that alienation from image-bearing with same-sex attraction. I want you to know, if that's your particular struggle or the struggle of someone that you know, Jesus is the answer to that, and that brokenness is real. And I don't want you to, to sense on any level that you're rejected or a second-class citizen. You are an image bearer, and God loves you and has a great plan for your life. We're told in Colossians chapter 1, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And he is the one who restores our true humanity. He makes possible for us to once again be who we're created to be. One of the things that's, uh, that accompanies Paul's teaching about the image of God in 1 Corinthians uh, and in, um, in 2 Corinthians uh, and um, in Colossians is a discussion of the body. Is a discussion of the body. 
And there's a deep sense in which one of the things that God is up to when he rescues and saves us is he rescues us even in our bodies. And we look forward to a a day ultimately in the new creation when we'll be given new bodies. God is interested in every dynamic in our life. And we're, we're to be sanctified in our gender as well. We're, we're to say, God, rescue me and use me as a man. God, rescue and use me as a woman. Help me to fulfill my calling and my purpose in every level. And that includes my gender as well. It's a created and redemptive goodness that God has given us. And so it's okay for you to say, and it's right for you to say into the world as you speak truth that gender is not just whatever a human being decides it is, but gender is a bodily reality, a gift that we don't design on our own, that gives shape to our life and our destiny. That biblical revelation, of course, is set against the sexual revolution that says, again, as I've already said, you can determine for yourself what your gender is going to be. The teaching that gender is just a social construct. Uh, The the, the reason why uh, there's a sense that women should act one way and men should act another is that's been imposed on us by uh, restrictive social structures that need to be thrown off. Have you heard about uh, the idea that gender is a social construct? Anybody familiar with that? It's just, because, it's just because boys are taught to play with trucks and girls are taught to play with dolls and boys get blue and girls get pink and all this stuff is enforced uh, on uh, uh, males and females and that's why these dis- distinctions are there. That's a common idea in much of modern thinking. But an experiment was done. Thousands of participants in dozens of countries, and here was the question, In places in the world where gender differences are really minimized, like Scandinavia. In Scandinavia, they work very hard to make sure not to give girls dolls and boys trucks. They make sure not to say this is what boys do and this is what girls do. Uh, They they very, very work very hard to make sure they don't have any of that imposed sense of male and female stereotypes. And so you would think that in Scandinavia, as the social pressure about maleness and femaleness went down that men and women would be more alike, right? You following me? You following the logic and the expectation of this study that was done? But here's what happened. In Scandinavia, men and women are more different in terms of their career choices and their personality. The less external pressure the more the differences were pronounced. Here was the deal. When little girls were left alone just to do whatever they wanted to do career-wise, most girls choose to work with people and focus on relationships. When little boys are left alone and not pushed in one direction or another, most little boys tend to want to do things more oriented to tasks than people. Now, that's not everybody. That's not every boy or every girl but it's a picture of our fundamental creational differences. And that's good that we're that way. And so we need with courage to say, we know what the definition and the truth of gender really is. And it's not good to tell people that they can live in conflict with They're given gender and the goodness of what life is going to look like in the gift of that gender. And so the first thing to see is that image in image bearing and gender uh, is that is that image bearing sets the pace and is the purpose of our human sexuality. Second, I want you to see the relationship between image bearing and marriage. All right. If we're made as men to be completed image bearers with a, uh, in relationship with a woman and made as women to find the completion of our image bearing with a man, then marriage is this beautiful gift and picture of how we live out our image bearing together. 
And so again, it's Adam and Eve in the garden. It's Adam and Eve putting in a vocational relationship together to, to go out as a husband and wife and to change the world. They're kingdom partners, beautifully matched to live together in world-changing relationship. But again, sin is an attack on marriage. That's what Satan attacks. It attacks Eve and disrupts those things. And Adam and Eve say no to God's creational ordering and as a result, they pull down curses on themselves. And so marriage becomes a power struggle. And this wonderful covenanted relationship now becomes a, a great difficulty. Marriage becomes a struggle and a hardship rather than a joy. But then Christ comes. And that picture of Christ being the head of the church and the, the church being his bride, a, a groom and a bride together coming back in radical love relationship with one another. The relationship between Christ and the church being one of sacrificial love from the church to Christ being one of, of reverence and a picture of love and respect that ought to occur in the relationship between a man and a woman who are covenanted together in marriage. And that redemptive picture of Christ and his church heals and redeems marriages and sets them free. Marriage is not a burden. It's not a hardship. It's not a socially constructed conspiracy to keep women down, but it's a doorway to freedom and a beautiful gift of God to us. That's the biblical revelation. But then the sexual revolution, again, says marriage is a product of the patriarchy. Marriage was invented by men to keep women down. And the long story of the relationship between men and women is one of oppression. Here's what's been happening between men and women as men have used their physical strength to abuse and mistreat and, 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 and uh, hold women down to treat them like property. When women take a man's name, it's a, it's a demonstration that she's being treated as properly, being, being basically sold from one family to be in another. And I'm telling you, that's, that's a feminist mythology. And the truth of the history of the relationship between men and women is that those relationships form a strong bond as they stand together against the great difficulty of the world. It's hard to be alive. It's hard to get along in this world with so many things against us. And so a man and his wife bonded together, relying on one another. Two are better than one. And across the centuries, they have stood together, and loved one another, and struggled together. But they weren't alone. And that's the call and the true picture and the true narrative of the life and relationship of, of a husband and a wife, especially as Christ enters in and calls us away from cursedness and back to sacrificial love and sacrificial respect. But the sexual, sexual revolution says we can redefine marriage and any configuration is fine. It's just as good for a man to marry a man, a woman to marry a woman, or, or any kind of configuration in there, and that works just as good. And that's a, a heartbreaking, death-dealing lie. It's not a marriage. Marriage is one man and one woman for life, bound together to face the difficulties and hardships of life. I heard it, marriage described this way. Uh, a man, uh, you, you, uh, for those of you who are married, you and your wife are fundamentally insane on your own, but you have just enough sanity between you two to create one sane person. And that one sane person get, you know, comes together to get through life together. And so one man, one woman for life is a picture of what it means to reflect the glory of God into the world in any other configuration is a, is a substitute that's been leached of power and purpose. And it's a trap designed to hurt, not call people in to the best of what God has for them. 
And so our image bearing is on display in our gender. Our image bearing is on display in marriage. It's one man and one woman in covenant relationship forever. And then finally, image bearing and the family. The image of God is on display in our gender and in our sexuality in a, in a husband and a wife and their children, either their biological children or the children they adopt into their families. And what you have in a man and a woman and, his, uh, uh, and, and their children is this crystalline structure that can bear up underneath everything the world throws at it. God has created this picture of fruitfulness in the world. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, subdue it and rule over it. As a man and a woman and children into the next generation, we are going to be God's glorifying workers, bringing God's order into the world. That's pictured in Genesis chapter 12 when when God says to Abraham, I'm going to have you be a father of many nations and you're going to be a blessing to all the families of the earth as this image bearing goes on and on and on all over the world. Of course, sin comes in, alienation comes in, the families turn against one another, the fathers and sons turn against one another. And the sorry history of Scripture, so much of it, is the failure to hand on that faith to the next generation, the failure of fathers to hand on the truth of the gospel to their sons and daughters. But that's been healed in Christ Jesus. At the very center of what it means to be justified is that we are people who are called back together in God's family, called back together across all the things that keep us apart that cause us to be hardened and prejudiced against one another. And Jesus makes a new family of faith. He turns the hearts of the fathers back to the children and brings us all back together underneath the fatherhood of God. Christ is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn among many brethren. And so Jesus is the one who pulls the family back together and restores us to the, to the Edenic picture of what God always had for us as men and women and the children that are born out of that covenanted love relationship. But the sexual revolution came along and said, actually, the family is the problem. The family is actually a source of difficulty, a source of hardship, and a source of oppression. One of the deep narratives of of Marxist thinking, for instance, would be getting rid of the family, letting the state raise the children because if parents are allowed to continue to raise their own children, they'll continue to give them these bad ideas about Christianity and capitalism and, uh, and, and ordering within the family. And so if you're really gonna redesign and remake society, you gotta get rid of the family. The sexual revolution with respect to feminism said dads are really not necessary. They're just incidental to the process. A single woman alone with her children can, can uh, be equally as effective, if not more effective, than having a man around to mess everything up. And so what we've got to do is we've got to restructure the idea of dad and mom and kids because that's actually bad for people and bad for the world. And so... Uh, within the Black Lives Matter movement, for instance. And I want to give a, an important distinction. I think we all agree in this place that, that black lives matter as an idea. All lives matter. Certainly we want to have an appreciation for and a love for people who are different from us racially because they are made in the image of God. But we need to be wise and grown up in our understanding. And that Black Lives Matter as a movement, just go to the website and look, stands for some values that work in direct opposition to the truth that we're image bearers, to the, to the basic concept that we are to recognize our value and recognize the value of all other people equally and passionately and sacrificially. And so here's what... Black Lives Matter says about the family. It's right there. This is not what I'm saying about what they say. This is, this is on their website. 
One of the things that's a part of their belief structure, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family. It is this new understanding that the family is actually a problem to be disrupted and eliminated. Oh, but it couldn't be further from the truth. And let me tell you, there's nothing loving about telling anybody. That the father is incidental and even problematic. The truth is, we're not really having a conversation about healing and redemption until we talk about the sickness of fatherlessness in our country. That's what's wrong with us. Is we've abandoned God's call as, as image-bearing men and women, children. And if we could find a way to call our nation, call fathers, and children, back to that fundamental commitment, there would be revival. In fact, the last statement about revival before the Old Testament closes is a promise that the fathers' hearts will return back to the hearts of the children. The great unspoken sickness in every community is fatherlessness. It's rampant among every people group. 70% of black children are born out of wedlock. And until we can talk about that, we're not really talking about solutions and redemption. And as long as we're trying to disrupt that, we're not doing anything that approximates love. And I know this about all men, it doesn't matter who they are, or where they're from, or what their race is. When a man is not taking care of his children, he's broken and empty on the inside. Purposelessness, want, purposeless, wandering, and broken. And so we need to be people who stand up to speak of the goodness of the family, the goodness of God's picture for men and women, and the great blessing it is to the whole wide world, and the great redemption that can come to it only through the gospel of Jesus Christ, who gives us a new understanding of father and family. Image bearing gives us the picture of who we are. Would you bow your heads with me? Do you know who you are tonight? Do you know who you are? Have you been told who you are? By the voices of the cultural elites, the philosophers of this age? God who loves you, designed you, has beautiful purposes for every part of you, every dynamic of your life. And even though we've all broken it, Jesus can restore it. He can give you a new name and a new identity. And so right now, you just may need to say in this moment, maybe out of your, your confusion, Jesus, I trust you. 
I trust your person and your plan for me. I'm going to follow you in every area, no matter the cost. Because yours is the way that leads to life. Others of you, you just may need a, a home, a family of faith. Maybe your own home has got a lot of brokenness in it, a lot of struggle, and you're feeling all alone. Well, we want to throw our arms around you with the love of Jesus, model for you a picture of family and faith. Maybe in the quietness of this moment, you would just say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to take a step of obedience find more about what it means to be a member of this church where I can learn the truth proclaim it and walk in it and then finally there may be some of you who just need to say God I need to learn how to courageously, gently hopefully share this good news this life giving truth that's struggling to hear it. Father, I pray that you will stir us up as a family of faith, stir us up as image bearers in the world, that we would picture in our lives, in our masculinity, in our femininity, in our families, we would picture the beauty of the gospel to the world that needs to see it. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here and worshiping. I want to uh, encourage you, if you made a decision of any kind or want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus or be a part of our life together, if you'll text your decision to the number you see on the screen, we'd love to, to, to reach out to you and encourage you and walk with you into what God has for you next. If you just have some questions about what I preached tonight or some, some questions about what's going on inside you, we'd be glad to minister and serve and, and encourage you even here tonight. We're going to hang around for a little bit uh, after the worship service is over. And if you need to talk more, uh, I'm here uh, to, to be uh, an encouragement uh, to you in whatever questions that you might have. Again, thank you so very much for being here. And even in these uncertain times, I can't wait to see what God has next for us.